All right, ladies and gentlemen, moving ahead, please join me as I welcome on stage Shri Anand Narayan, whole time member, Securities and Exchange Board of India, Security and Exchange Board of India. A huge round of applause. A very, very good evening to you, sir. Pleasure having you here with us. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Padmanabhan was here a short while back, uh, and he asked me to warn you that I'm going to give a very long speech. And if you're still awake after the speech is over, uh, then the panel discussion can ensue. Uh, at the outset, my compliments to the Global FinTech Fest for putting together this premier FinTech event of the year. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address this gathering. Uh, I will take this opportunity to share some thoughts on the use of technology to improve efficiency and transparency while lowering risk in securities trading and settlement. Embracing technology and rethinking processes in the financial sector in a calibrated manner can significantly boost efficiency and transparency while reducing overall risks for investors. However, such changes can disrupt traditional business models for intermediaries and institutions. It is quite understandable, therefore, for some to fear or resist change in the short run by arguing, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. History has shown, however, that well-calibrated changes, in fact, are imperative for our economy to progress and to realize its immense economic potential. As a result, policy or regulatory nudges are at times required to bring about changes. In addition, by adapting their business model to these changes, intermediaries and market participants not only survive, but also thrive as increased efficiency and reduced risks can act as a significant force multiplier to drive the growth of the entire ecosystem. Today, I thought I would use the examples of the payments and settlements ecosystem and our own securities market trading and settlement ecosystem to illustrate this point. Thereafter, I thought I could share some thoughts on the possible path ahead to improve market efficiency, transparency, and reduce risk in our securities market as we prepare for the next phase of capital formation. The transformation of India's payments and settlements ecosystem is a perfect example of impactful change. Just a few decades ago, my generation relied on postal orders, demand drafts, and outstation check clearing to move funds. While this was accepted as state of the art at the time, Looking back, it meant significant delays between when money was sent and when money was received. The high fees and potential for operational errors only added to the inefficiencies. These delays benefited banks as they earned substantial implicit and hidden float income from holding funds in transit for days together in an era of high interest rates. When I started my banking career in 1993, transaction banking and cash management businesses thrived on these inefficiencies and opacity. Since then, technological advances spurred by the government and the RBI have transformed the landscape. The changes include the introduction of ECS and EFT in the 1990s, RTGS and NEFT in the 2000s, and the digital revolution driven by UPI since 2016. Through all this, contrary to what one might have feared, transaction banking has only grown in profitability. With efficiency spurring economic activity, banks have found new opportunities to provide value-added services like liability management and information management to attract client balances and businesses. The revenue model has morphed from taking a big and inefficient slice of a small pie 
to taking a smaller size of slice of a tremendously larger pie, which has still left banks better off by some distance. There is a parallel in the industry that I represent today, the securities market ecosystem. In the 80s and 90s, equity settlement followed a fortnightly cycle. The actual trading flow remained largely opaque to the average investor. In fact, you could be given any price between the range of the day or sometimes even outside the range of the day. Transaction costs were high and often a significant percentage of transaction value. Security settlement was paper-based and manual and prone to frauds, errors, and delays. The intermediary ecosystem was typically and arguably the beneficiary of such inefficiencies. Since then, our markets have witnessed tremendous changes nudged by the government and by SEBI. The introduction of transparent online trading in 1995, the birth of our first depository in 1996 that gradually moved physical certificates to electronic ledgers, the introduction of the T plus 5 settlement cycle in 2000, the T plus 3 cycle in 2002, the T plus 2 cycle in 2003, and finally, complete adoption of the T plus 1 cycle in 2023 were all watershed moments. Explicit broking charges today are a tiny fraction of the rates charged in the early 1990s, often tending towards zero. Anyone who skipped the last three decades might be forgiven for thinking now that in the face of such dramatic changes in the securities market ecosystem, the revenue streams of the securities market intermediaries and institutions would have been wiped out. Quite the contrary. Instead, the revenues of market infrastructure institutions and intermediaries has dramatically increased through this transformation and continues to grow handsomely. This has been driven by a significant increase in the investor participation in securities market and by intermediaries adapting their business models to embrace technology and client value add. From 25% of GDP in March 1993, BSC market capitalization has risen to over 150% of GDP as of July 2024. From less than one crore unique DMAT account holders as of March 2011, we are nearing 10 crore unique DMAT account holders today. The list goes on. It is impossible to imagine all this happening if the transaction costs, inefficiencies, and risks of three decades ago persisted today. Before we discuss the way forward, it is important to recognize some unique features of the Indian securities market ecosystem that allows us to be a pioneer in further improving market efficiency and reducing risk. First, while depositories exist in all major jurisdictions, India has the unique architecture where all investing individuals and entities directly hold securities in electronic ledgers maintained in one or both of our two depositories. In other jurisdictions, they typically are multiple layers, with individuals holding securities with an intermediary, who in turn may have their securities with a custodian, who in turn may have an account with the depository. In India, both depositories interact with our clearing corporations, and hence transferring securities from one person to the other is practically akin to transferring funds from one bank account to the other, with minimal layers to traverse. This is the reason why, by the way, we are able to implement things like T plus one with as much ease as we do. When we go to ISCO meetings, etc., frankly, our counterparts in other countries start by asking us, do you have some strange DLT technology that we're not aware of? You know, how are you managing to implement these things? This, alongside our securities clearing corporation architecture and our payments and settlements ecosystem, including UPI, holds out exciting possibilities to further improve efficiency and reduce risk in the market. We've already taken some calibrated steps in this regard including introducing the beta version of the optional T plus zero settlement and introducing the facility for trading in equity secondary market 
using the UPI block mechanism, what we colloquially call ASVA-like in second secondary markets. Both these initiatives are first of their kind globally. Of course, it would be fair to ask the core question, are there any material additional inefficiencies and risks that linger in the securities market ecosystem? Are we trying to over-engineer things out here? In this regard, it is instructive to look at some data points. <coughs> Put together, brokers currently hold around 2 lakh crores of client funds on their books on a given day. Note that 90 to 95% of small value stock purchases below 1 lakh rupees involve pre-funding the broker with the actual settlement due being only on T plus 1. Brokers typically place such client balances into bank fixed deposits and other permitted instruments and earn interest on them. Even at 6% per annum, which is low, the implicit annual income for brokers from such balances is over 12,000 crores. This also explains why zero brokerage as a concept operates in some market segments with some brokers. To be clear, leaving funds with brokers is the way things have always been. And this is the way most major markets operate. Nobody is finding fault with that. In addition, there are checks and balances instituted by the intermediaries themselves by market infrastructure institutions and by SEBI to safeguard client funds and securities. These have been periodically strengthened from the learnings from mishaps such as failures of some brokers. Nevertheless, brokers are not scheduled commercial banks and do not have the full set of capital and other regulatory safeguards that banks have. From a transparency, efficiency and risk perspective, we would all be better off if the implicit broking revenues from having client float balances were to be eventually replaced fully by explicit and transparent fees set in a competitive market. For their part, I suggest that investors should also be willing to pay reasonable market-driven and transparent prices for accessing capital markets in a responsible manner knowing that there is no such thing as a free lunch. As an aside, inefficiencies and opacity dog not only the Indian domestic investor, they also impact the foreign portfolio investors. While India moved fully to a T plus one settlement cycle in January 2023, most FPIs are only able to access their funds from sale of securities on T plus two or later. Some of the inefficiencies that have crept in here are frankly man-made. Before custodians can remit out funds to FPIs, they need to ensure that all relevant taxes have been withheld as required and as advised by a tax consultant. Hitherto, custodians would provide the details of transactions to tax consultant only after the settlement of the trade on T plus one. The tax consultant would then provide the requisite details later in the evening on T plus one or beyond, thus making funds practically available to the FPI only on T plus two or beyond. After a regulatory nudge from, the, from SEBI, aided by market infrastructure institutions, this is soon set to change. Custodians will provide details of the FPI transaction based on inputs from clearing corporations on T plus zero evening itself, so that tax related formalities can be completed early on T plus one, well in time for the funds to be remitted out the same day. Incidentally, the typical float lying with custodians is estimated at around one lakh crore rupees, of which a significant portion arises from the above lag in remitting funds to the FBI. As in broking, the implicit income from such float, along with foreign conversion uh, linked revenues, allows Indian custodians to charge practically zero as explicit custodian fees. The principle that transparency would foster all round trust and reinforce that India is a business friendly jurisdiction again applies. 
So what's the way forward? It is in this light that SEBI is taking some calibrated steps as mentioned above to improve efficiency and transparency while reducing risk in the ecosystem. The beta version of the optional T plus zero settlement window was introduced from March 2024 to test waters. We had initially thought about using this optional T plus zero as a transition to an ambitious optional instantaneous settlement. However, while the SEBI board will ultimately provide us guidance in this regard, for now, perhaps continuing with the optional T plus zero settlement alone might be the more calibrated and prudent option. In January 2024, SEBI also introduced the facility for trading in equity secondary markets using the UPI block mechanism. We have yesterday floated a consultation paper seeking public comments on a proposal to make it mandatory for large qualified stock brokers or QSBs to offer such an optional facility to, to investors with a suitable glide path for implementation. Your feedback here would be very welcome. From sooner rather than later, we expect custodians to make available funds to FPIs on the same day of settlement itself, rather than holding it back, waiting some tax clearance. We are fully conscious that changes particularly technological changes, need to be calibrated in a manner that ens ensures that the ongoing technology and cyber resilience of the ecosystem. To that extent, SEBI has always followed a glide path approach to around any change implementation with full engagement from all significant uh, stakeholders, including with market infrastructure institutions and our market intermediaries. In conclusion, our securities trading and settlement ecosystem has come a long way over the years in furthering efficiency, increasing transparency, and reducing risk. Alongside many factors, this has paved the way for a significant increase in savers accessing our capital markets. All stakeholders, market infrastructure institutions, brokers, and other intermediaries have played their stellar role in this journey. In the medium term, we still have a distance to go in our journey towards sustained capital formation. Where there are nearly, while there are nearly 12 crore unique investors accessing capital markets through SEBI regulated entities, CBDT data suggests that over 57 crore PAN numbers have been linked with Aadhaar. At the same time, of course, as more investors flock to our capital markets, we need good quality issuers to raise risk capital and ensure that a virtuous cycle of capital formation ensues. The journey to improve efficiency and transparency while reducing risk, therefore, needs to continue. We have no doubt that we, as we progress on this path, all stakeholders in the ecosystem will only see their opportunities grow over the medium run as capital formation expands the size of the overall pie. For our part, we in SEBI will continue to engage, consult, calibrate, and provide appropriate glide path for implementation of any agreed changes to minimize any disruption and to ensure the continued resilience, including cyber resilience, of the ecosystem. Thank you again for this opportunity and for your patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. All right, with this, moving ahead, as already mentioned, the topic for this panel, technology and the evolution of settlement procedure in the Indian security market. It's okay, sir. So the moderator for the session, ladies and gentlemen, please join me as I invite him on stage. Please put your hands together for Mr. Srinivas, Jain Executive Director and Head of Strategy, SBI Mutual Fund. A very good evening to you, sir. Let's welcome the speakers on stage. We have Ms. Vaishali J. Babu, MD and CEO, Indian Clearing Corp Corporation Limited. A very good evening to you, ma'am. Looking really pretty. Next, we have Mr. 
Motilal Oswal, co-founder and CEO, Motilal Oswal Financial Service. Let's give a round of applause to him. And we have Mr. Nehal Vora, MBA and CEO, Central Depository Service India Limited. Let's give a huge round of applause. Our 10th session for the day, ladies and gentlemen. Please have a wonderful time. Over to you. Thank you. We also have Mr. Vikram Kothari, Managing Director and CEO, NSE Clearing. Let's give a huge round of applause to him as well. Thank you. Um, so we can't miss Vikram. <laughs> <laughs> No, firstly, thank you so much. Uh, we have a lovely panel of market intermediaries and one of the largest market participants. Uh, and I don't know why I'm here in the panel. <laughs> I'm on the other side. But uh, it actually, when Anansar was talking about the whole journey the Indian market has gone through, I was uh, kind of nostalgic. You know, I started my career 30 years ago in broking. And I remember uh, writing contract notes uh, every day in the evening. I did a little bit of jobbing too in the market, uh, you know, and then whole bad delivery settlement. And just think about where have we gone from a T5 plus 15 kind of a cycle to now a beta version of T plus zero and I don't know when SEBI will agree for instantaneous fund. So it is a fantastic journey and kudos to all the market intermediaries who made that happen. Of course, market participants like Motila Loswalji has been pioneer in making this change. So I will not take much time. Let me start off by my uh, questions to the panel here. Maybe Nehal, you are, you are one of the, again, you are one of the key critical market infrastructure provider. What do you think has been the key factor that has driven the market to a settlement cycle, T plus two, T plus zero, now T, T plus zero beta? And uh, you know, as a, one of the largest depository, what would you say for the, what are the factors that have been facilitated towards that? So first of all, uh, I'm uh, really thankful to JFF for really calling me for this very August panel. And I was really blown away by the speech of the whole time member, Mr. Anant Narayan, where he really juxtaposed the entire journey from where we were to where we are and where we want to be. And really taking a cue from that, uh, what he mentioned, I think the key difference where we stand out to the world is we are a segregated account structure. The whole world is an omnibus structure. And right from money laundering concerns to investor protection concerns, that's something which we have solved right at the inception. And really kudos to SEBI to really stand its guard in 1996 when the entire Depositories Act was getting formulated after about 100 years of uh, the exchange system running to move to a completely dematerialized and not a immobilization of share certificate. That call was a very important call where shares, physical share certificates actually got destroyed and it was moved to a completely dematerialized form only. So that became the only source of truth there was, uh, which had to ensure. And therefore, the role of depositories has been extremely critical in ensuring that whatever is getting held as the wealth of the investors is the golden copy. And it's a segregated account structure. So each investor has its own uh, account of what he or she holds and doesn't have to rely on someone else. The second big thing I think is uh, the entire journey of uh, because it was dematerialized and electronic, technology played an important role. So the flab in the system or what we often call as a human touch uh, as an excuse kind of went out of the window. Uh, it was a technology which moved that. and. You know, a lot of people ask me, and this was also raised, that you know, as more and more regulation comes in, control comes in, it's, it is probably going to contract the market. It's not going to contract, it's going to expand the market because it builds trust in the system. To give one, only one number, I'll not give too many numbers, but way back, not too long ago, in July 22, 
the settlement volume was 1585 crores. It has grown last month four times to 6758. July 22 to July 24. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's fantastic. So this is what testifies the controls which we have put in place. And the final thing which I think I would uh, like to put is that when the entire system is moving from an account period settlement to a rolling settlement at T plus 15 to T plus 1 and to a T plus 0 in a beta phase, not so long ago I was in a conference in Australia where they are yet contemplating T plus 1 in 2026. Uh, and when uh, they asked me about the experience, I said the regulator was mature enough, kept the market interest in at prime most, where it has a phase-wise introduction. There was absolute silence in the audience. You think, how did your MIIs manage to run two settlement uh, systems simultaneously? From an investor interest and from a market interest, this is what they have actually demanded from their own market infrastructure, that this is the model which we would like to do. No, that's kudos to both the market intermediary and the regulator for making it happen. Nowhere in the world you would have had a, you know, we, we write a lot about it in the papers, but really we made that happen. But, you know, Vikram, uh, you, know, it has, you know, technology plays a very critical role in all of this, right? So this whole transition has, you know, going down now to uh, two days to one day. The entire ecosystem, brokers, the custodians, global custodians, all, all should have tried to adopt this, right? So can you just highlight some of the key, you know, facility fa factors that have been part of this journey? So I think the first uh, Shrinivas, if I was to look at the firm belief that technology is an enabler rather than an impediment, I think that thought process was very, very important for all the entire ecosystem to come together. Not TFA only, wouldn't have happened otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> not only the clearing corporations, the depositories, the intermediaries right. right from global custodians, etc. But if I was to look at two big facilitating factors and if I was to bucket them, I think first would be the regulatory facilitation. Uh, if I talk about regulatory facilitation, Nail alluded to this phase-wise approach, right? Uh, I think a unique way of doing it, where starting with the bottom most 500 securities, we have almost about 6,000 listed securities across both the exchanges and then bringing in phase by phase. And what that allowed us, that regulatory facilitation allowed us to do is, in fact, I was mentioning the other day, on the first day when the first 500 securities, actually the bottom most 500 securities went uh, into the T plus one settlement, we were pretty much, we had to be ready with our entire systems, the depositories had to be ready with the entire systems. And I think if I'm not wrong, we settled one rupee 28 pesa on the T plus one wow, window. fantastic. But what that one rupee 28 pesa actually did was that it took our entire system through a rigmarole of a complete test with production data and interfacing coming from everywhere. And we are pretty much prepared, okay, if something breaks down, I always have an Excel where I can process that one rupee 20 <laughs> pesa, right? But I think that phase-wise approach, what also it did was the entire intermediary ecosystem, including the custodians, the global custodians, the depositories, we could keep testing our systems as we moved into the last phase of the th thousand securities where most of the investments lie from the foreign investors as well. So I think that was the regulatory, one regulatory facilitation which was very important. But one of the big catalyst factors which actually aided us in a big way was upfront margin rules in capital market. What it did was that the investors who were selling securities were already to avoid the margin obligation that comes on sell side were already delivering more than 90% of their sold securities on T plus zero. And then the marriage with the NPCI framework and the payment settlement system for the purchase side with RTGS, NEFT, the UPI framework, and pretty much from the foreigner's perspective, the FX markets being facilitated 24 into five, the way it is today. Uh, that allowed us to take all the customers, including the sell side as well as the purchase side, into a streamed uh, uh, cycle, so the regulatory facilitation. From a technology perspective, I would say again, uh, a lot of process re-engineering, we as clearing corporations and depositories, shrinking 48 hours into 24 hours is not easy. 
So you had required a lot of process engineering where we did a lot of decoupling, parallel processing, and one innovative thought, rather than going for a confirmation based model from the institutions in the last day of settlement or the prior to settlement, we move, move to a rejection model. Everything that has been traded for them is assumed to be confirmed till you reject it out. That means your processing times came down significantly. So I think a lot of these thoughts put together, bringing our te technology guys together, uh, looking at the processes, re-engineering them, and using a bit of thought process to look at things differently. Oh, I think that's what brought about. Oh, very uh, interesting. And this is something that, you know, when you push to, push to the corner, we innovate. That's, you know, that's something that I hear here. But Vaishali, you are, uh, you've been on the, uh, part of the market infrastructure, but new to the block on the clearing corporation side. So your previous role as a, a depository participant uh, or a DP uh, or a, uh, you know, you've been a custodian for a uh, lot of FIS. They must have gone through hell during this period. How did you, you know, how did you manage them? or How, how did they look at this whole process? Definitely. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, so just to start off with, that time Vikram and myself, we were on the other opposite side and fighting with each other. So now regulator put us on the same side. That's where. Uh, having said that, um, see, room is not built in a day. Right. You know? There are certain difficult path India has chosen. I think whenever we used to speak to the foreign FPIs or FDIs and all that, two things, India is an ID market. You want to invest in India, you need to be registered. Somebody, Mr. ABC, cannot come and suddenly start off. And that related KYCs and all that stuff kind of a thing. Very difficult, believe it. Secondly, as Nehal and even Vikram said, you know, segregated. Believe me, there has been huge amount of pressure on overall, especially the regulators, but when the whole, all developed markets are on omnibus setup, why India is getting into a segregated? But believe me, this itself has helped us in moving to the T plus one in a more efficient manner. As an industry, when we were discussing, you know, one thing we need to give applaud to the whole community. You know, of course, regulator pushed us you said you need to think and as you rightly said that when you're pushed the best comes out of your mind you know but the whole industry including the broking within the broking institutional and retail brokers and all that all of us came together everybody had a very different agenda everybody had different difficulties see the same valleys look from different sides so what the two principles especially from the institution side was the you know writing on the wall this is what we need to avoid one is we do not want Indian market to be pre-funding. Because I think before India, if anybody, any other market, leading market has moved to T plus one was China. And, but hardly any trade, you know, we have really gone big bang kind of a thing. And there, there have been some pains observed and because of which it did not work. Um, so that is something we had decided that this is what we'll avoid it. Secondly, the failure rate, right. you know, reducing all the, transaction settlement has to happen through a clearing house, not any DVP trades. So if we have to do this too, what we need to do? So we decided I have to climb Mount Everest and then we decided what we need to do to climb that. Whether do I wear a jacket, whether do I reduce my weight or do I carry, you know, all the uh, arms and ammunition. So that's the way. And I think during that journey, I do not know whether it's an official, but you know, T plus two to T plus one. See, we moved, as Anansar said, you know, we took almost two decades to move from T plus three to T plus two. Why it is difficult T plus two to T plus one? Because it's not only, we are not reducing by 50% time. Our time available is only one third. This was told. And that piece, how you can, you know, manage it with the help of a technology. Nobody else. Of course, Vikram's uh, like we, we did really process and re engineering at every level CC level, exchange level, brokers, custodians, and all that. So, these were certain things like uh, this helped almost close to 11,000 FPIs to move. Uh, one piece specifically for FPIs, you know, money pocket really hits hard because, uh, you know, in India we have done all this NPCI, UP and all that, but these, you know, these animals, they have to take care of FX, conversion and all that. 
there were certain uh, difficult uh, you know situations that we had to we seek even other regulator thanks to rbi uh, for really you know by the time rbi has said that you can do fx 24 by 5 okay means okay, principally you can book fx in the night 2 o'clock also but again we have to be realistic that night 2 o'clock i'm not going to get the kind of a liquidity which i wanted okay so how do we go about it so that confirmation happens in t plus one early morning believe me when i was on the custodian side so we, our shift used to start at morning six o'clock okay used to start means now also it starts like that so there was no other way but to work in a different time zone to manage this you know uh, uh, the the cutoffs and then give the same kind of experience as the t plus two in the t plus one area so this was the thought process around. I think it's fantastic. I was uh, just listening to all three of you, and I feel there is a, somebody has to write a book about the whole history of how these things happened. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's one to listen from market participant, uh, market intermediary. But the, Oswalji, I think you bring the highest amount of wisdom. You've seen it all. You have run a business. You run the company. You see the front end of what's happening. What, what, according to you, has been this whole transformation from your side? How have you seen this at your lens? Yeah, uh, Srinivasan, you started 30 years back. I started 37 years back. And uh, I've seen uh, uh, settlement cycle. Uh, we used to call it uh, T plus 15, but it used to be T plus 30. Many times the settlements uh, used to get merged. And when you get the, even after T plus 30, you get the sales certificates. There used to be a lot of set certificates which used to be in objection. You give it back to the brokers and I don't know how many days you took to back to get it back. And from the investor's perspective, it's still after fighting so much, you get your shares in hand after 15 days, 20 days, or maybe after 30, 40 days, you send the shares to the company for transfer and it used to take three months to 12 months. So you can see from where we have actually transformed from one year logically maximum time to now one day or maybe same day. It has been fantastic transformation. And I think that I would give credit to the exchanges, to uh, regulators and the all market participants to make sure that we have really made it happen. The market size was very, very small. Uh, and now you can see uh, uh, millions of transactions happening every second and uh, without any hitch. Uh, I have seen uh, uh, not only on this side, but when it used to be open outcry system, the, even the trade match which is instantaneous today, it used to be at least 8 to 10 percent of the transaction which used to be in trade mismatch between the brokers. Brokers said that I have sold and the other side also said I also have sold. So it used to be a lot of problems on that side with I think the technology and the regulatory uh, infrastructure have actually solved those kind of problems. So now we can say that uh, from the investor's perspective, actually it used to be the broker's uh, market from the seller's market now to the investor's market. The investors actually are empowered and uh, uh, the, laws, uh, the, the laws definitely safeguard them. It is in fact the other way around where the laws actually are against the people like us which is in favor of the market, which has given huge amount of trust and transparency to the hands of the investor, which is a great thing, uh, if I have to summarize. No, I think it's a very good point. The market has moved from a broker's market to an investor market. It's a very uh, powerful way to look at this whole transition. But, you know, back to you, Vaishali. Now that it's already happened, right? Now the transition has happened, right? How are you dealing? What are your institutional investors saying? Now we've, we are at T plus one. We are at uh, T plus zero beta. Uh, what is going to happen? How will you make this now go? Uh, I mean, how are your institutional investors looking at it and how are you making it happen? Uh, so again, uh, any interesting thing happens in Indian market and India is a leader. Believe me, uh, I think one thing which I did mention in my earlier thing, US started thinking about going to T plus one somewhere around 2018, 19, 19 rather. And at 19, they said that they will go live in 2023. Okay which actually because of COVID and all that things, they went live with T plus one in May 2024. We started thinking about it in during COVID 20. Everybody from home, okay, all big bang. And we made it, we started off in 2022, we completed in January 2023. So that's the speed. We took whatever more than two decades, but we have taken less, close to just a year to move to T plus zero beta version. 
and whatever new is happening definitely indian market is a leader in terms of the new thoughts new processes so fpis have shown their interest in t plus 0 and again we have the herculean task of giving them the same experience as t plus 1 so i think the thought process has been as we know that beta version we have said that same day money should be available same day money you can make it available at night 8 o'clock no this doesn't really serve the purpose so we need to really give it in a decent time and again back tracking has happened again mount everest higher mount everest so this is where we are now so what we are doing currently is that we have worked out a concept of a family code which will help at least within a group of fpis to move in together into this t plus 0 very clearly it is an optional why within the group so this is if i can call it it's a cusp between segregated and omnibus with limited way very conscious move right. to go with this kind of a concept see how it is happening we are going a ahead with only few scripts right. you know we will see how does it impact will make ensure that fps participate in the journey they're happy with the overall process flow they're happy with when they are getting securities they're happy with when they are getting funds they are happy as anand sir mentioned you know there is one additional layer for fpis especially with respect to the tax so there is a different thought process as to how we can do about you know getting this as asap okay so that they are not having no benefit kind of a thing so all these thought processes are there and we in all ideal scenario we should be able to do this or we are planning to do go live with this in october so uh, this is again beta version just for everyone this one beta version small number of uh, scripts limited trading time and of course uh, optional aspect so with this we will test the waters uh, with the fpis again this wouldn't have been this is the last thing i would like to say this is wouldn't have been possible without consultation because that's the biggest strength that we are having we are continuously engaged with this foreign participants because their issues their problems their benefits are different and we need to be cognizant of that so that's the it's a, it's a very fair point we need to be it's good consultation and but i'm sure something very big and powerful will come out of this whole uh, process but neil just turning a little bit about uh, you know you manage uh, uh, depository there has been a boom in the amount of uh, dmat accounts uh, that's there how is it impacting efficiency how are your uh, how are you enabling ensuring customer protection as part of this big boom of Uh, explosion in the amount of uh, dp accounts that been opened so uh, you know my favorite uh, analogy is that if all dmat accounts were a country we would be the ninth largest country in the world at 16.68 crore <laughs> dmat accounts and you still have a long way to go as far <laughs> yes. as in terms of pan numbers and other it's a, it's a huge data so here i would say sebi came out with two very very important and critical reforms on the depository side one was on the electronic delivery instruction so the entire account opening to transaction to pledging became paperless right so during covid when everybody was working from home and most markets were shut most industries were shut the securities market then shut for a second also and i think that is really the testament of the vision of sebi to move to a completely a digitized and a paperless form that when these kind of black swan events occur uh, the markets can continue number one but on the specifics on the transaction we have uh, in the depository system something called a eds system which is that in a b2b business the authorization is b to c what i mean to say is that the fintech players if they want to have a sale for a customer a of 1000 shares of tcs for example and uh, obviously the broker fintech broker will need to have the authorization to debit now earlier it used to be the broker himself would send the otp to the customer there's a possibility of a fraud and sebi in its vision came out with a excellent concept 
that the customer will have to now authorize directly with the depository. Hmm. So it's a B2C. It's a B2C. But it doesn't lose the efficiency of a B2B because it all happens in a fraction of a second. So moment the customer authorizes with a CDSL, CDSL will send an electronic flag to the fintech broker that you can go ahead with the transaction. And that doesn't stop the efficiency of fast online confirmation happening. So that was the first thing. The second was the pledging. The margin pledge system is unique to the world. Now the real concept is in a pledge, it was normally for years together of the power of attorney where the shares would move from the customer's account to the broker's account. And the customer loses visibility of where it's going. Right. He has to humanly trust the broker that he will not do any fraud. There was a paradigm shift in margin pledge. Now the shares remain in the customer's account only. But there is a pledge flag of the depository which comes. So he, he cannot resell it to, uh, he cannot resell shares which are pledged or he cannot re-pledge it to someone else. Right. But he has visibility that he's pledged it from him to the trading member. The trading member will re-pledge to the clearing member, the customer again knows. If the uh, clearing member re-pledges to the clearing corporation, he, the customer again knows. If the clearing corporation releases the pledge and the clearing member invokes the pledge, the shares directly move from the customer to the clearing member. The transfer. This concept has led to a complete expansion of the financialization market of the securities lending piece, which is helping the shares trading also go to the next level. And the last piece which I think is again very very critical is that we will be moving uh, shortly to a direct payout system. So till now the payout of securities would happen from the clearing corporation to the through the depository to the clearing member and then it will get paid out to each customer. Now there's a direct payout happening to the customer. So uh, the trust in the system is growing even further, where technology is used that you are now the fulcrum or the focal point of every part of the trading, clearing and settlement mechanism, which is going to increase the trust in the system. Ah, it's fantastic. You know, there have been many, many firsts that we've been working on. I think Vikram, uh, I want to understand why India is behind all this being first and what are the real benefits? You've seen the world, you've gone around and spoken about it. What real benefits are we getting out of this? So, uh, uh, Srinivas, I think uh, uh, what a phased approach allowed us to do as a clearing corporation, we've got an in-house research uh, team. And in fact, uh, we did a, uh, we could, because of this phased approach, we could do an academically rigorous uh, research paper. In fact, that's been published in some of the global, uh, uh, leading global uh, uh, journals as well. Oh, and fantastic. in fact, uh, we have been asked by some of the regulators like ESMA and all also to share the paper with them because this is the only research which actually does that. And two key findings out of that what we saw, December 22, uh, before we completely migrated, and when we took the T plus two bucket and when we did data on that, the margin requirement was at about $700 million on a daily basis on an average in cash equity. Uh, that's about 5,600 odd crores. And after we had moved into March 23, when we took the data set of March 23, and when we looked at the data of the margin requirement, it had come down to 2,600 crores, little around two, 300 to 350 million dollars. More importantly, while yes, the margin saving is there, more importantly, what we saw is liquidity, this money getting flowed into a different set of securities, not the top securities, but in the second run securities, which started leading to impact cost reduction. That means the liquidity on the order book depth of the second rung of securities actually started increasing. So fairly we could infer, one, that yes, requirement of money across the ecosystem has come down. That's spurring liquidity in the second rung of securities. More importantly, also from on the ground, T plus two are fail rates for institution. You did allude to that, Vaishali. 
uh, when we were in the T plus two cycle and everybody was very comfortable with the 48 hour kind of cycle, it was in that 0.5% fail rates is what does not get confirmed by the custodian and what devolves onto the broker. Used to be in the rate of 05 to 0.4%. When we actually migrated the last the, the two buckets, we started for a week or so about at 1%. And, but within a week or two, the entire ecosystem evolved, they understood. We've settled down, I think now below 4.4% or 0.3% is the fail rate that we are working at. To mention when DTCC or US went live on May 20, in, on 28th May 2024, for a week their fail rates were in the range of 2 to 3% and they actually put out a headline in the press, we are at normal rates. <laughs> 2 to 3% is not what we saw, E1, on the first day. So I think from a data uh, no. perspective, it's been a big move. And theoretically, if you look at it, uh, less exposure uh, uh, rather than two days to one day, I think benefits everybody right from the capital market ecosystem as well as the investor because you are getting your money and your funds one day earlier. No, I think uh, it's fantastic. Now, we're all sitting in basking the glory of everything that we have done. But uh, back to you, uh, Oswalji, all this would have been very costly for you, right? You are the entrepreneur building a business, a founder who's setting up this whole stuff. A lot of change is happening. You have to now invest in technology. You have to give knowledge to your partners. You have to educate your customers. This is, would have been a big thing, right? How did you how did you go about doing this, sir? I mean, I mean, we can say hundred things because uh, it's easy as an institution, but you are the ones on the ground really doing it. Yeah, uh, I think the market opportunity has been fantastic. If you see what uh, Ms. Anand Raman said, that really I think the number of clients, unique clients going to 10 crores now. So I think we are in very exciting time, uh, as a, not only as a capital market, but as a country. And we all know the data. So the issue is that how to really now exploit the opportunity and now take this market size where only 4.5% or 5% of the savings, financial savings come to the market while the globally it's uh, it may be about 70-75%. So we are all re ready for that kind of explosive growth and the biggest component for us is the 2T, the technology and the talent. Right. And both, you know, it takes yeah. time to really, I think, uh, find the best of the technology, cost efficient technology. We as a firm, we invest about 8% of uh, our money on technology, uh, of our uh, revenues on technology, which is expanding. So a lot of investments in happening all across with uh, data center, with uh, disaster uh, recovery sites, or uh, various kind of, I think, uh, creating a, a huge amount of in-house uh, team using the AI and the power of data science and all. And at the same time, to make sure that our talent is ready to cater to all kind of customers. Because we have the customers, retail customers from an age of 18 who are do-it-yourself to uh, the people like 80 or 90, uh, 90 years, which really are not so tax savvy and you got domestic institutions, you got global institutions. So I think it's very exciting time in the sense. Of course, it is very, very challenging and regulators also keep pushing us uh, uh, to make sure that we become far more efficient, we become far more transparent. And I think uh, that's what uh, the challenge is all about, that how do you manage those kind of uh, complexities, but uh, to make yourself much, much uh, better first and then bigger. That's the job of the entrepreneur. <laughs> That's the job of companies like you. But kudos to you, sir, for having built a fantastic brand and gone through this whole process. We have almost run out of time. But I didn't want to leave all of you without a, a googly kind of a question. So much we have achieved. You know, we, we, we are all here basking in the glory. One thing that you would feel that you still need to achieve, if I can go around the table very quickly, just 10 seconds each. I think this was real Google. <laughs> so I think the next thing which I feel with the help of AI, you think that what you will do and you will implement it. Excellent, very good. I think same, to utilize the power of UI, a human plus UTI to make sure your customer get the absolutely instantaneous service in terms of device based on their profile and uh, they feel much more safe and secure. So I have a slightly different take on this. Uh, I think till now we have all made it easier where from customer being feeding into the exchanges and the entire MI ecosystem, it has now gone down to the customer being the fulcrum. I think one thing which I want to see is the customer having the right toolkits to trust its own self. Okay. So the importance of 
education for the customer himself or herself before they invest so that the right type of client suitability and product suitability is done and can I trust myself to ensure that I don't blow up my present so that my future is really bad. Rather, I secure my present in such a manner that my future is even more secure. That's a very good point. Investor education, self-awareness is a very big thing. Vikram, last question. Really, a lot of points have been covered. Uh, but uh, I would like to say, I think, somewhere the financial greed has to come down. While the system can only aid to do that, but an educated investor, to some extent, if you look at from the institutional perspective, I think data democratization is uh, data democratization assisted with satiation. I think an educated investor, I think, will take our markets to a different uh, plateau altogether. So. No, fantastic. It's a nice way to end the session. I wanted to thank uh, whole time member Anand sir. He's just, I think he's just left. But thank you for all my panelists for such a lovely session. We could have taken some question, but we're already very late. But I'm sure some of you are available for questions uh, post this session. Thank you so much for coming here and thank you for all our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. That was a lovely panel. Thank you.